Freddie Green to exit that front cockpit. And the famous one, two, three, and four step up to the top wing. Once he's up there, arms outstretched, waving to the crowd. Bob Martin, very delicately, in the airplane. Bob pulls back on the stick, trying to keep the machine going out the screen. Across the top now, he'll be checking the altimeter and the speed if everything looks good. After the single barrel shotgun is complete, he will complete the double barrel. Diving the airplane down, looking for that entry speed. If he doesn't have it, he won't pull back. He's got it this time. Comes back up across the top. Now, looking for the smoke once again. In the sky is overhead, Oshkosh. Now, the double barrel loop is complete. Coming back down to the top side. Now, Eddie Green riding through that 160 miles per hour breeze. And welcome back to the Hudson's Freedom Festival Fireworks. You know, just as we celebrate the 4th of July, Canada celebrates its birthday. Tomorrow is Dominion Day in Canada. That's right. Happy Dominion Day to all our Canadian friends over there. And you know, one of the big events on the uh, Windsor side is the Windsor Air Show. They have pilots and planes from both sides of the border. And uh, we caught up with a couple of air show performers who see the world from a rather unique perspective. <laughs> The spirit of these fearless flyers lives on in wing walker Eddie the Grip Green and pilot Bob Barden. I've got more time on the outside of an airplane than the average pilot does on the inside. Just pour on the power, turn on the smoke, down we come and do our best. I've got the ones on the top, did you, Eddie? Between them, Bob and Eddie have over 50 years in the air show business. They are members of an elite group of aerobatic experts based in Ann Arbor, the largest group of professional air show pilots in the world. Danny Clistum's got his foot on the power. The ladder looks good. Eddie is making a reach. He's really reaching. Here we go. Okay, we just turned upside down at 6,000 feet, and we're going to do the inverted flat spin. And now, in order to do that, you've got to stall the airplane, so come back on the power. There we go. Stall the plane. Kick full right rudder. Put in full out spin aileron now, and pull the power back to cruise, 24-24. We're now spinning 360 degrees every two seconds and descending 250 feet with every spin. Let's do 16 spins. Count the spins by watching the sunshine go down the K bean struts. Okay, the trees are getting taller. Now to recover. We get to that point, which is pretty soon now. Come back on the power, full opposite rudder, neutral stick. Good job. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of sets the stage uh, for our show today. Now, the first thing I want to do is to pass the microphone around and have everyone introduce themselves. And not only that, fellas, but I'd like to have you uh, share with us. One, one thing out of your air show career that the general public, the viewers, would be really interested to know. So Bob, why don't you start it? Okay, Dale, I will. And I'm Bob Barden, senior, and uh, been with the Ann Arbor Air Force for about 25 years, maybe longer, and... He's senior because he's older than any of us. <laughs> Uh, and that report was, of course, certified by a professor from the University of Michigan, Emeritus Bob Lijak. <laughs> and uh, one of the <coughs> thoughts that occurred to me uh, when we were together for this great event was when I first f started flying air shows a long time ago, 
it was related to me that a, a famous uh, philosopher by the name of Thoreau once said, there is no stronger bonding agent than shared danger. Think about that in the air show industry. <laughs> there is no stronger bonding agent than shared danger. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, viewers of this great, wonderful group, <clears throat> that is what causes us to have the greatest relationship and the strongest friendship and feeling of any other group that I have ever been associated with. And with that, may I then pass the microphone to my great friend, Professor Emeritus, Bob Lijak. Your turn, Bob. You can't believe that once we were all young. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> I know, Danny, I've said that about you often. You were never young. You were born old. <laughs> I'll pass the microphone on to our stuntman, Eddie Green. They call him the grip. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. It's a pleasure being here with all you people. And my name's Eddie Green. I uh, started doing air shows around uh, 1959. Uh, I literally started with uh, just doing air, or, uh, skydiving. But uh, we'll talk about that a little more later on. Uh, I live uh, out at Portage Lake. And I have a lovely wife named Lynn and five children. And I'm going to give this on over to Danny Clisham now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Grip. I'm Danny Clisham. I'm the announcer of the group. Uh, also <laughs> growing up in this area and to have this much talent in the air and to have the variety that they can maintain, it takes somebody to describe it to the crowd. And my goal, my job as a kid from the time I was a teenager, was to do a better job than the generation of air show announcers that were out there, to be able to link the spectators with the stars in the sky, these guys from Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor Air Force. So I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. I've been around airplanes since they showed up in my dad's backyard, courtesy of the guy that you're going to meet next on the right. And uh, Danny Clisham, Sky Talker, Hollywood, USA. <laughs> and now on to Captain Jim Minning. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim Minning. Uh, got started in the air show business about 1951 when Wayne Major had their first air show. We took all Sturman over there for Bob Young, who was Mr. Aviation at the time in the state of Michigan. And uh, ever since then, we've cranked it up in the air show business. And uh, I've been uh, just privileged as the years roll on to uh, have all these worked with all these fine gentlemen and like Danny said we'll get into more of that later thank you thank you uh, it's just amazing to see what Eddie Green does uh, and Eddie I'm not trying to put you on the spot here but uh, tell us a little bit of the history of how you became involved in and how you learned to do what you do wing walk well <laughs> to start out with there wasn't too many uh, stuntmen uh, before me. There was a few, but they were spread out all over across the United States. And uh, I met up with uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Barber at uh, the Napoleon Air Show. And uh, we was doing some skydiving out there on a Saturday and Bill Barber was scheduled to do a little uh, aerobatic flying on a, a Sunday afternoon. And he was out there watching the skydivers and I was about the only one that was landing right out there in the, in the uh, packing area. <laughs> And uh, so he walked over to me and asked me if I would uh, be interested in making a parachute jump, an American parachute jump, uh, for his, the beginning of his show the next day. And I said, well, yeah, what, what do you mean American? So he explained it to me of uh, how you tie a flag to a line and hang it below you, and they would play the national anthem after uh, my chute opens. Mm -hmm. And then when I get close to the ground, I would pull a or the uh, American flag up and stuck it behind my reserve so it wouldn't touch the ground. That's how, sort of how I got started. And uh, one thing led to another. I ended up meeting uh, Danny Clisham and Jim Menning and Bob Lijak here. And uh, we did a few air shows. And I ended up working for uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Sweet out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, national air shows. And uh, Harold Cryer, Charlie Hillard, 
Ed Mahler, all these guys, uh, and they were all basically. Uh, Harold Cryer was a three-time United or a World Aerobatic Champion, and so was Charlie Hillard. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first air show with uh, Bill Sweet and Harold Cryer was in Miami, Florida. <laughs> and I thought, boy, this is quite a deal, you know. <laughs> and that's where I sort of met Charlie Hillard also the first time. But uh, just to go on, I've, I've been doing air shows since uh, about 1959. I started skydiving in the early part of 58. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, 3,286 jumps. Wow. Somewhere around uh, 3,000 to 3,200 uh, plane transfers. Uh, around 3,500 uh, wing acts, uh, riding the top wing with various uh, airplanes of mm -hmm. uh, Bill Barber, Bob Barden, uh, Harold Cryer on the Great Lakes, and you don't see me too many wing walkers on top of little great lakes <laughs> and also uh, Jim Franklin I uh, flew with him for uh, a few years off and on to fill in with uh, uh, stuntmen that uh, sort of come and go on his part mm -hmm. but uh, the biggest pleasure was really working with my own guys right here in the in the uh, town of Ann Arbor right. Jim Menning and Danny and uh, Bill Barber and I used to do a car top landing with uh, my pickup, he'd land a little J3 Cub, clip wing Cub on top, and then uh, when Bill sort of uh, got away from air shows and retired that, uh, I started working with Jim Menning over here, and of course he had a whole new, a different approach on doing the uh, car top landing. And uh, <laughs> so, but th they all worked out real well because, you know, we'd go out and practice, mm -hmm. and then I had a person one time, uh, asked me uh, in an interview when we was doing an air show, she says, uh, when do you go out and practice? And I says, we just did. <laughs> we just did at the air show. It's uh, wild enough and crazy enough and dangerous enough to put this act on without practicing, you know, mm -hmm. day in and day out. We just do it at the air shows. We know what each other's moves are and so on and so forth. Now, whose idea was it? Was it your idea to, to start doing that or did someone approach you? Well. When I started with Bill Barber, I started out doing the skydiving. And uh, he says, uh, if you'll come and do some air shows with me, so I'll give you $50 a jump. Well, this was back in 1959 and 1960. And he says, you can do two jumps a show, maybe if we have time, three. And I'm going, 50, 100, 150. <laughs> I, Man, this is good money. I've got to do this. <laughs> well, then one thing led to another. He uh, thought maybe it, if I was interested in doing something else. so. Danny and Bill and I went out to uh, the airport one day and we practiced doing this car to plane transfer. And he told me how to do it and this and that explained to me. And he says, go home and build this rope ladder. He <laughs> says, when you get this rope ladder built, he says, hmm. well, go practice. That's sort of how I got into that. So you actually did the car to plane transfer before you did the walking. Uh, uh, wing, um, yes, wing walking, yep. It's, we sort of, it's, I guess you could call it a graduation of mm -hmm. skydiving into doing the car to plane mm -hmm. and then uh, doing the uh, wing act. And then uh, we also did a couple firewall crashes, Bill Barber and I did, mm -hmm. where I'd be hanging on the ladder uh, below the airplane after the transfer and crash through a flaming wall. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, uh, Bill was always uh, the renaissance man. He always wanted to do new things, try new things that people did years ago. and. Uh, so that's how we become started doing the car top landing. Mm -hmm. He asked me if I thought I could build a, a rack for the uh, pickup, and he says, I'll pay for the material. Uh, you build it, and he says, we'll own it half and half. And I says, fair enough. <laughs> so that's how we got started in the car top landing. Well, go through, uh, go through your, your mental thoughts from the, when you're out flying uh, and, and are about to do your wing walking. Uh, kind of start from that point as, as to what your thoughts are at that point and uh, to the end of the uh, performance? Well, first of all, if I'm flying with Bob Barden, for instance, uh, we'll talk about the routine. And he tells me what maneuvers we're going to do and what rotation they are and so on and so forth. So I know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is in my mind. And then uh, after we get in the air and I get on the top wing, I'm basically in my mind flying this airplane. Even though he is at the pilot's mm -hmm. uh, controls, in my mind I, I know what he's going to do. And so I've got this pictured in my mind. And uh, anytime I move off the wing rack to 
start moving around on the airplane like I do. Uh, people ask me, isn't it real windy up there? How do you hang on and this and that? And I said, I've learned to, from the experience of skydiving, how to use the wind and the air to my advantage. Hmm. Because when you're skydiving and you're free falling at 120 miles an hour, you can make a left turn and a right turn. You can do back loops. You can track across the sky. Uh, people s still see you falling, but you're actually going across the sky, across the ground by a means of what we call tracking. And so I do the same thing when I'm on the wing. Uh, instead of reaching out for a cable here, I'll reach maybe a foot, foot and a half in front of it and just let the wind take my hand to it. Oh. And I do the same th things when I walk mm -hmm. with my steps and even getting out to the uh, wingtip and sit down. I use all of that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. I sort of lean into the wind mm -hmm. and uh, that way I, I'm not trying to hold on to everything so tight. Mm -hmm. Did you come up with the, that strategy yourself or is that how other people have done it through the years? Well, I've talked to other wind walkers, uh, an old buddy of mine named John Kazian, and uh, he basically sort of says the same thing that this is what he does. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just something you learn as, uh, and you get used to uh, as the more you do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. of course I've got so much air, so many hours of flight on the outside mm -hmm. of an airplane, it just, <laughs> it just sort of feels natural to me. You know? Well, one last question. The, the uniform that you wear, does, does that serve a practical purpose as well? Oh yeah. If you lose anything or wear anything that's loose, it uh, will like vibrate in the wind and it will literally burn your skin and so on and so forth and, mm -hmm. and flop around and it also creates a lot of drag. I wear a uh, tight leather helmet. Uh, so I don't create quite so much drag there, and I wear a tight outfit that's tight to my legs and my skin and my body. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sort of go through the air as, as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. you and Bob, are you and Bob able to talk to each other up there? Probably not. Uh, no, yeah. not really. We yeah. use hand signals. Right. Uh, like if once I get up on the, uh, uh, once I get up on top wing and get strapped in, I'll sort of turn around, look at him, and hold up my. Uh, thumb, we're okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything he wants me to look at or take a pay, pay attention to, uh, he'll uh, wiggle a stick back and forth and the wings will rock back and forth mm -hmm. and I just turn around and look at him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. One time uh, Bill Barber and I was doing a show and uh, well, we was doing a sort of a documentary for uh, uh, a TV show in uh, Chicago and uh, we got up in the air and he wiggles the wings and, and I'm getting out of the airplane and he wiggles the wings and he's going like some motions and I didn't know for sure what he was saying so I went back to the rear cockpit and hung off the wing mm. and we had my right arm down in the edge of the uh, airplane in the cockpit and we talked about what we was going to do oh, for heaven's and sakes. redid it and then I rushed back up stepped back on the wing and walked back up and got on the top wing. And I never seen Bill's eyes get so big <laughs> when I come back to talk to him. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, Danny, could you, uh, could we move the mic to Danny? And sure. Just run down for the folks that have never been to an air show, what, what you see when you come to an air show. My job, from the time the gates opened up, which may be 9 o'clock in the morning, my job is to let the people know that they're being welcomed, let them know where the action is, tell them about some of the things that are going to happen, tell them where they can go to see something they want to see special, where there's an open large airplane like a military cargo airplane that they can actually walk inside of, uh, things they can't do every day and to just walk around and enjoy the sights and sounds but be ready with your your eyes and your cameras at high mm -hmm. noon because we're going to we're going to play our anthem and st officially start the show. And then from the time the show starts till the time it ends, I am uh, supposed to be able to entertain the crowd without repetition, to let them know things that uh, they might not know before about certain airplanes in a way, and, and no offense to the professions, but in a way that's a little clearer than when your doctor talks to you <laughs> or when your attorney talks to you. Thank you. And I've always envisioned, uh, I had a great grandmother, Jimmy Menning's mom, and uh, she's a little five foot one lady. She used to come to air shows. And I envision I want my grandmother and everybody else to understand what's going on. I want to <laughs> talk over their heads. I want to be part of this action. So I've been fortunate enough to do that since I was able to wrestle a microphone away from 
Captain <laughs> Jim Henning. He went to the John, and we locked the Porta John, and I did the rest of the show. That's not a real story, but it sounds good at any rate. And there it is. Uh, we uh, I started doing this a long time ago, and I finished uh, the the, night, the 2008 season just a couple of weeks ago in a town called Stewart, Florida. A great show. Uh, their uh, 17th show in a in a row. And uh, we're cranking up for next season, and I'm going to do this uh, uh, for a long, long time. Because there's no better place to be <laughs> on the weekend. There's no more fun that I can have. There's no other place that I'd rather be. And, in fact, when I get a weekend off, I'm not very happy. You know? <laughs> I want to be out with a gang doing stuff and entertaining people. I want to be with, uh, with the people who are in show business through aviation. And uh, that's the... the the great happiness of my life, and I hope it goes on forever. I've had a ball. So have these great people here. Well, let me give you a real challenge now. I'd like to pretend we're at an air show, and you're introducing the man sitting to the, your right. Okay, uh, you know, it, it is the tradition to uh, be able to enhance uh, a, a act a fellow already has. So uh, here, here's an airplane taking off, and out of the airplane comes a rope ladder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Jim Minning professional airline pilot throughout the week, air show star on the weekend. One of the five routines he's going to accomplish today in this airplane. Right now, he's going to try the impossible task of trying to drop the ladder in proximity to a speeding car down the runway where this man, stuntman Eddie the Grip Green, will attempt, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a foregone conclusion, <laughs> will attempt to grasp the the ladder and transfer from the speeding automobile on the runway via the ladder onto Jimmy Minning's airplane. Now, the wind is a big factor in all this. We've got a crosswind today. You'll see that the rope ladder is swaying the opposite direction of the car. That's a challenge for Eddie Green. Also, that rope ladder cannot get mixed up with the wheels and the bumper of that automobile. So that means the driver has responsibility. Eddie Green will be guiding the driver as to how he wants the car with speed and direction down the runway. Usually, it's with the center line right between your legs. All right, now they're going to try it. They're going to go down the runway. They've got their speed match. In comes Captain Jim Minning. That rope is wild. It's twisting. It's turning. It's swaying. This is going to be tough for Eddie Green. As they get towards the end of the runway, they're running out of runway. Eddie Green calls, call it off. Let's go try again. Folks, take a breath. Reload the cameras. They're going to try it again. We'll see. The challenge is on today. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Minnings, Captain Jim Minnings, went and Eddie, the Grip Green's going, wow, I did all that. But uh, they will try it again, generally up to uh, three times. Uh, and the conditions, as challenging as they are, were usually not able to overcome the expertise of Eddie and Jimmy, or Eddie and the late Bill Barber. Get the job done, get on the rope ladder, and then start another act from there. We call that Eddie Green's jogging at 80 miles an hour, hanging <laughs> beneath the airplane via the rope ladder. So yeah. on and on it goes. All right. There's five hours of that, and by that time, people are throwing things at me. <laughs> but they get the show over. So that's part of my job. That's part of the act. And uh, which, Sir. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment on that. Uh, I have uh, had an opportunity, and a great opportunity, uh, and it takes, uh, I should back up and say it takes four people to do that car to plane transfer act. Somebody's got to drive the car, and I've done that a few times. Somebody has to fly the airplane, and I've done that a few times. Somebody has to announce that act. And I've done that a few times but. because the current <laughs> announcer, who we, I'm just uh, coming up behind here, when uh, he has an opportunity, he always calls, Bob Barden, report to the announcer stand. <laughs> and so he can drive the car, and then I announce it. <laughs> and uh, then the fourth one takes a tremendous skill on, from Eddie the Grip to climb up that rope ladder. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm one of the few in the world who has done three of those <laughs> four acts. And no, I do not think I ever will be climbing up to grab a hold of that airplane flying down the runway. Well, let's hear from Jim. We've talked a lot about him. Jim, uh, 
fill us in on, 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 this, the, on this car to plane transfer. Is that something you developed in, in your mind? And, uh, oh, no. Uh, all I did is uh, pick it up after Bill Barber and the rest of the people had done the act time and time again. Uh, big thing about Bill, when you met him, uh, he brought you along real slow. First, you ferried the airplanes and associated with the air show people, and then uh, then he got you into doing this, and then he would ask you if you'd be interested in doing one of the acts, and he'd work you into it. And uh, he was a great uh, mentor and a great teacher, and he knew everything that was about to, that was going to give you a problem. And he, uh, you were, by the time you did it, it was, uh, you were shaky, but the facts were in your head, and if you did listen to him, it all worked out real well. But you were, you are a commercial pilot. Has that been an asset to you in the in the air show business? Not in the air show business to speak, but all facets of flying is an asset to you because you run into different circumstances uh, with different airplanes and 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 different things that you do. Um, the more you're in an airplane, and the more different airplanes you fly, and the more scenarios that you get hooked up into uh, help you in all mm -hmm. all your line of thinking down the road. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's uh, any experience that you can get, whether it's hangar flying, being with guys that know what they're talking about, being with air show people. Mm -hmm. uh, man, there's so much talent right here <laughs> uh, that you know, it isn't, you don't walk away from it, you listen to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, the, is it very critical to just have it right on the button in order to do that kind of transfer? Well, I mean, uh, yes, uh, the car driver, the stunt man, I'm going down the center of the runway as much as I can. And, I, and what I'm trying to do is Eddie gives me a single for the level where he wants me to level off at. And then it's my job to try to keep that level there. And it's my job to keep that level there when he's doing the run away run because you let him down two feet, he's on mm -hmm. his knees running down mm -hmm. the runway, you know. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing that, uh, that, that really opened my eyes was the uh, boat to plane oh, transfer yeah. uh, in the there. Detroit River. <laughs> I look down and the boat's like this, and the next time I look down, the boat's <laughs> like that. And, and, and I see it sliding up and down the rail, and I'm, I'm, I'm figuring, how in the heck are we going to do this, you know? And then the next minute you know, you hear this loud whistle, and boom, you're gone, and that's it. Now, now back up a little yeah. bit and, and uh, start that whole thing in detail, because there's been very few boat to plane transfers done over the years, and you've got two guys that are the only contemporary pilots who are alive and stuntmen who are alive that accomplished it. So start the location and why we were there. Well, Detroit City Airport was the first location. And for the boat to bring? Yeah, well, that's where we were going to operate off of to yeah. go down to Detroit River. Right. For, and the, for the Detroit Renaissance. Right, Detroit Renaissance, yeah. A big celebration between Windsor and Detroit on the same weekend. Yeah. Freedom Festival. Yeah, and uh, you remember all that stuff. <laughs> you, know? you don't want to remember. <laughs> uh, the, the big search was, uh, I remember trying to find a boat, and, uh, then, a, and, then, this, and then a driver. Yeah, a boat fast enough. So they come up with a cigarette boat, and I guess they're the racers along yeah. Florida. And uh, they, you can correct me on this, but uh, I thought at the time that this guy thought he was an expert. Wasn't he the boat driver? Yes. Was he an expert? No. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that generally is what happens when you, uh, when you work with people you haven't worked with before. But he had never done a transfer, so... But he could drive a boat, and uh, we, I think we made, what, one practice run or two practice, not a practice, but trying to get the, everything yeah, straightened out? Actually, two. Two, and uh, the first one when I went down, uh, I could have used about three beach towels because the water was coming inside <laughs> the cockpit because we have to have the, the door open, uh, and uh, everything open, so when he gets up there, he can mm -hmm. come in and dry off. But. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the first thing I seen was the boat about gear high. I mean, it was bopping out of the water, and we followed it down a little ways. And I pulled up, and the next thing I pulled up, now he's way down there, like you're on the top of a hundred floor of a hotel. So I, 
it was really, uh, I didn't think the first time that it was going to be feasible with that guy driving. Um, but then I, as we came back around, I seen you giving him an earful, <laughs> and I said, well, you know, maybe we can correct this. <laughs> <laughs> second time wasn't so bad, and I third, the third time we picked him off. And uh, when we got down on the ground, I had more people ex-girlfriend saying don't you ever do that again you know <laughs> but it wasn't me that was in trouble it was him. <laughs> but eddie's uh such a professional that uh he pulled all this stuff off and it was uh like nothing ever happened but well, jimmy is that the time you had to fly underneath the ambassador exactly, bridge exactly yeah legally yeah, yeah. legally yeah legally under yeah. the ambassador yeah. bridge first time was when don Pittman went out <laughs> Illegally. <laughs> well, that was the Bell Isle. <laughs> the Bell Isle. <laughs> that was a real change. Yeah, okay. At any rate, uh, 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 to enhance uh, Jim, uh, he did approach from uh, underneath and in, in between the spans of the Ambassador Bridge during this Windsor and Detroit Freedom Festival. It's a great gathering. On both sides, a lot of action and activity. And so, uh, from my point of view as the announcer, I'm watching this whole thing happen. And uh, no, Th this all, may not be the way it happened, but it's the, the way I remember it, too. The Detroit River is treacherous. It is dangerous. It is deceiving. It is the devil incarnate when you're trying to do things like this. I remember once, I think I remember once, that <laughs> as Jimmy said, the boat went up. I remember the wheels of his cub disappearing. That the boat actually came up, and he it was gear height, yeah. So I said, "Whoa, this is pretty interesting," <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, but they made it happen. It was uh, it was spectacular, and it uh, hasn't been accomplished on the Detroit River by anybody else since. Wow. Sorry. Hey. Don't be serious. Uh, I forget a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> you want to forget a lot. Of <laughs> Jim, on the on the jumping back to the car and plane transfer. Who dictates the speed? Is the is the car supposed to catch up to the plane, or is the plane supposed to catch up to the car? Or? These guys dictate it, and they catch up with the airplane. I do a steady speed, and then they, because I'm working with wind, it's slowing me down or speeding me up. They're not. They're on concrete, and they can govern it. They they do mm -hmm. all the work down there. Right. I just my idea is just to maintain a straight line and a good solid altitude mm -hmm. that he's already keyed me up on. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob, let's get uh, you in on this conversation here. Um, maybe you can, no, no, you, the professor. Uh, <laughs> tell us about how this whole business has evolved from the first time you became interested to where we are now. Well, first you've heard the name of Bill Barber. He has touched all of our yes. professional lives. In fact, he was the one who got us organized to be the, the Ann Arbor Air Force. Uh, to tell you how he touched my life, uh, I had never been up in an airplane other than in an airliner. Did that twice. I was at the end, <laughs> advanced age of. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the time. <laughs> I was on my honeymoon, <laughs> and I didn't even love you then. <laughs> um, the way Bill touched me is he gave me my first open cockpit airplane aerobatic ride. And uh, after the flight, he turned around once and we were upside down and uh, he looked around and I had <laughs> my hands hanging out of the cockpit, put them up in the air, upside down. Now I had a reason for that because prior to that I was hanging on to the bottom of the seat whenever we got inverted <laughs> and then I said, now wait a moment, if that seat belt opened up, there's no way I could hold myself in the airplane. And so I did that to get up the courage to say, I really trust this seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most spectacular <laughs> ride I ever had in my life. Bill and I went for coffee. And remember, aerobatic flying was very rare in those days. 
What year would this have been? What, about what year would this have been? Uh, bah, 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 1957. Okay. Uh, we went for coffee, and uh, <laughs> Bill thought it was unusual for a person who'd never been in an airplane and then ended up hanging his hands out of the pocket. <laughs> and he could tell how much I enjoyed this experience. And he m made a proposition. He says, Bob, I'll teach you to fly that airplane. Now, Bill was always very shrewd with the dollar. He says, if you pay for the gasoline. <laughs> well, gasoline, Pretty good. aircraft, yeah. gasoline was rather expensive in those days. It was about... 35 cents a gallon. <laughs> so I could afford that. <laughs> Bill taught me to fly. Uh, he was the most important person in my life for my aviation career. And uh, I bought the airplane from him and uh, started going out to practice aerobatics. Uh, Bill taught me some maneuvers before I even passed my pilot's test. And uh, as everybody else, they, the importance of a commercial pilot's license uh, is you can't charge anybody for anything. Do an inertial act and get paid for it? Can't do that. Well, we were always very keen on being paid, and that was one route to do it. <laughs> I, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to think you've heard all of these men here uh, speak of this man. And believe me, he brought us together. Uh, I credit Bill with the most important thing he taught me was how to stay alive and have fun at the mm -hmm. same time. Uh, to say it's been an exciting life is a tremendous understatement. And uh, I think all of us have bonded together, and maybe it is because of that shared danger. I always thought I was the only one who was scared. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're all in this advanced age, now they admit they were scared, too. Uh, I think there's only one person in this room who's older than I am. He would never <laughs> admit it. Uh, he happens to, to have gray hair. He does have hair. <laughs> and a big handlebar mustache, <laughs> which makes him look about two years older than he really is. <laughs> I pass the mic over to Bob Barton. <laughs> oh, gee. Comments about Bill Barber. And uh, as you have, of course, recognized, uh, he was the mentor and uh, the magnet for all of us. And I recall a couple of things that... Uh, I had personal uh, problems or personal uh, contacts with Bill. And I recall one time I was graying out when I was doing outside maneuvers where you're actually pushing it out and having negative maneuvers and then going down and pulling on the stick and you get into the positive uh, G-forces. And uh, I was graying out. What does that mean now? Great. My eyesight was limiting, and uh, it could have been disastrous mm. since uh, it uh, <laughs> makes your visibility go zero. So on the, I was down back on the ground, and I said to Bill, I asked him, I said, Bill, you know, uh, you mentioned that one time that you had a little gray out. And I said, I'm getting the same damn thing, Bill. I'm graying out on doing these air show maneuvers. And uh, he looked at me, and he said, well, Bob, that great Bill Barber grin. And he said, well, Bob, you know, I can tell you that uh, we share the same reason for graying out. Your damn eyelids are too loose. And when you're pulling those G-forces, your eyelids are coming down over your eyes. So next time you try it, try and physically keep your eyelids open. And ladies and gentlemen, that saved me a long time. The voice of experience. Huh? Indeed. Another time uh, that Bill Barber uh, made a comment to me that was very important in my uh, air show career, 
was after I had done shows with Bill and the gang here uh, of several years, Bill uh, and I were together uh, enjoying life at uh, <clears throat> a magnetic bar. <laughs> and Bill said to me, Bob, uh, I would like to have you show me your low show. And I said, Bill, the low show? I mean, I fly down to the uh, surface of the ground now. I said, you can't fly any lower <laughs> and last anyway. And he, he looked at me and grinned and he said, Bob, I'm not talking about that part of the low show, but you should have a low show in case that the uh, uh, ceiling doesn't permit you to fly your regular air show routine and so you have to change your maneuvers and you should have that all in a order and be able to practice that so that you can still fly your air show act get paid as your contract <laughs> requires and fly a different routine than your regular one and thank you, Bill Barber. It was a few shows later when Bob Lijak and I and Jimmy and Danny and Eddie were all together at a show up north somewhere. And the visibility uh, on one end of the runway was 700 feet. And on the other, it was 800 feet. And Danny Clisham said, okay, Lijak, you and Barden go up there and circle the jumpers. And I said, Danny, there's no way anybody can jump with the ceiling that low. And he said, well, I know that, Bob. But Danny's remark was, we'll just pretend that they jumped. And you guys, Bob and Bob, can go up there and circle the intended jumpers. Oh, and we'll open the show, which we did. And then uh, we both did our act. And thank you, Bill Barber because I had a low show routine that I was able to do safely <laughs> on that air show. And it was just another wonderful experience that I shared with this wonderful group. <laughs> and thank you, gentlemen, for the wonderful experiences and the thank great you, friendship Bob. that we've had. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you. And back to Dale Leslie. Okay. Uh, I think that's great. Ended on a, a very high note, and uh, we hope you've uh, learned a lot about air shows. I certainly have, and uh, and appreciate the amount of effort that goes in to not only produce them, but of course to perform. Thank you, and we wish you a good day.